Good morning and welcome on Friday, March 22nd, 2024. It's Vasi Papadopoulos here, and we've got a new episode of The Future Of. Uh, I'm super excited today as we have Pamela Allen, a very special guest of mine. She is the Chief Executive Officer of MD Financial. And for a lot of our listeners uh, who may not know uh, what MD Financial is, uh, it's a company that offers advice and investments for Canada's physicians and their families. Uh, A very important uh, group uh, within Canadian society. And um, Pamela is here with us today to really have a great conversation around the future of investing and pensions. Call me Pam. Okay, I will call you Pam. Thank okay. you. Okay, great, great, <laughs> great. Uh, so welcome, welcome. Um, maybe just to give a little bit of background, I know you have a very long uh, and storied career <laughs> uh, within investing. You've been yes. with MD Financial now for, I think if I'm correct, about 17 years. Yes, yeah, and just over 17 years. Just over 17 years. And in uh, 2022, you were named... Amazingly, MD Financial's first ever female CEO. Yes, yes. Seventh and first female. Seventh CEO and first yeah. female. That's yeah. that's quite an accomplishment. Um, and I thought maybe before uh, we wanted to get in there, uh, wanted to maybe ask you uh, a little bit about your background. You know, how did you end up uh, in this space? You know, uh, how have you? How long? Um, you know, have you were you interested in investing at a young age? Mm-hmm. With, something that um, uh, you lo- you wanted to do as a career. And did you sort of like at an early age uh, really have your sights set on being a CEO of a, of a large company such as MB? <laughs> um, yeah, always interested in investing, making money. I, I started my first job. I had a paper route when I was in the third grade. My brother and I shared a paper route. And so I learned that, you know, saving money, buying my, I I wanted a bicycle. I had to buy it myself. So really got into it at a young age, Um, applied to university because it was expected in my household that we would be going to university. So I was kind of uh, torn between science and business. I got into both programs and I went with business and that just at the U of A, University of Alberta, I was born and raised in Edmonton. And I just, the more I learned about the markets and economics, the more I enjoyed it. I did consider being a lawyer, but then I came out of university and started as a a bank teller and just continued to work my way up. And it really interests me. I loved leadership and I loved investing. So I did, I was an investment advisor for a number of years and then I got into leadership because I really enjoyed developing others and working with others and seeing them achieve their goals. So, and then when I knew about MD and uh, when they approached me in Edmonton to join the company, I thought, yeah, this is a great place to be, a great place to work. I interviewed with a number of leaders at MD and knew that this was uh, the company for me and planned to stay here for a long time. Didn't have my sights set on being a CEO. Okay. Um, yeah. I always, this might be a bit, I took my mom to see a psychic one time. And uh, so I asked her, the psychic, about my career. I said, you know, I was young. I, this would have been 25 years ago. And I said, where do you see my career going? And she said to me, and I still remember this, you will continue to go up the corporate ladder to the highest point you can. And I thought, yeah, well, you know. And then when I got this role, I'm like, wow, <laughs> she was right. Because I never joined MD thinking I'm going to be the CEO. Right. But my view is, you know, where I want to go. I don't have my sights set on the next role, but just what I want to do and accomplish. So it wasn't about getting to the CEO role. It was about being part of the growth of MD. And I just happened to get the CEO role. Mm -hmm. I I feel like you almost may have to track down this psychic psychic from 25 years ago, because uh, I know sometimes you may not want to believe that, but uh, it was, uh, I think it was a she, it was a, she was very prescient. So that's quite a that's quite a story, actually. Yeah. 
Um, and I also know, uh, you know, we talked about this earlier that you are the, the first female yes. uh, CEO of MD Financial. Uh, I know that there is a real push to make uh, more gains within the just in, in general, sort of the, you know, financial um, industry to have more and more women in leadership positions. Like, what do you feel uh, you being that first female CEO, like, what does that mean for you? And what, what do you feel um, you have to carry in terms of a leader with that, with that title associated to you? I, I take it as a responsibility to pave the way for other women to, not only women, but even visible minorities, to show that it is possible and a responsibility to bring others up. Uh, you know, when you're going up the corporate ladder, the further you go up, the bigger the responsibility you have is to uh, bring others up. We're making good strides in the financial services industry. 50% of my leadership team is women, uh, which I'm very proud of. Uh, we now have a new global head of uh, global wealth management in Scotia, Jackie Aller, joined from Royal Bank. So we're starting to see some strides, not where we want to be especially in the uh, investment advisor space, mm -hmm. only 15 to 20% of advisors out there are women. And we need to change that to get more women in visible minorities. So when I came into this role, I knew I don't want to be the last female CEO of MD. And I want to continue to show others it's possible and you can do it too. And when they see others, you know, when other women see me in this role, um, they know they can do it too. And it was interesting. I had, I posted something on LinkedIn and uh, for International Women's Day and an employee actually wrote on there that I was inspiration for her daughter. And that mm -hmm. just warmed my heart. Like that meant so much, you know, that her daughter saw me as an inspiration. And that's what I want to do is inspire others that you can do it too. And I'm helping to pave that way for you. And then, you know, as others come behind me, they will pave the way for others. So mm -hmm. it's a big responsibility. Yeah. And I also know, like, you have a, a reputation or you're known for somebody who's a, a nurturer of other women. I know within your organization, um, you've set up, you know, very specific programs. Like I see, like, the, the Visible Leadership Program, Women in Discretionary Wealth Management yeah. Leadership Program. Like, what would you say, um, you know, to that daughter you know, that, that woman who posted about her daughter, what would mm. your, be, what would your advice be, you know, given all your years of experience, you, you've gotten to the top of this industry, like what would be some words of advice or professional advice that you would give to um, younger women entering into this business? You know, one thing that I did, uh, some of the experiences that I had, I realized that no one was going to tap me on the shoulder for that next role, um, I needed to make those things happen for myself. So I, I have a few examples where, you know, I decided that I was going to be proactive in creating my own opportunities and talking to the people that could help me with that. Uh, you know, women tend to downplay. I was reading a mm -hmm. stat the other day. They downplay a lot of their achievements. And that was one thing that, I realized early on, I used to, when I was an advisor, I had a brag book of all my achievements. And if I did a review with my leader or something, I should, here's what I've done. And I tell the story as well about a, another company I was at that uh, I wanted to move ahead. And I saw an opportunity for a role that didn't exist and building a team that wasn't in place yet. And I actually went to my boss and said, listen, I think you need this role. Uh, you don't have it right now, but here's why I think you need it. I would love the opportunity if this comes up to take on this role. And he said, okay, thanks. And so it wasn't right away, but he did come to me and say, you know what, it's time. We we realize we need this role. And since you brought it up, we're going to to give it to you. So it is about, again, don't feel 100% ready for a you're going to learn in the role. I didn't feel 100% ready as a CEO. I knew I had a lot of learning to do. Mm -hmm. You're always learning. So again, make things happen. Uh, don't wait. Uh, make sure that, you know, 
you're, you have that, you know, the stories behind you that here's what I've achieved. Here's what I want to do. And, and take a seat at the table, you know, the lean in all of that. I was talking to somebody about, you know, when you sit down at the table, make sure you're taking up the space that you belong there Mm -hmm. and you need to be there. Um, Don't take notes at meetings because (laughs) we tend to take on a lot more, but it is about really taking control of your future and what's the worst that can happen. Someone says, no, not right now. Uh, But I, I'm at that age where I think I don't care what people think about me, right? I'm going to take the chance. That's true. Yeah, absolutely. So then what, what would you say, like a, all, all very good points, uh, especially the, uh, I fully align with you on the, uh, I, I actually, my, my mantra is say no to office housework. As you mentioned. Yeah. yeah. This is one of those things where, it we have it it's fine but yeah. it, it we, you know in terms of equity we can also spread that around too because right. you also as a woman want to take on other things mm. uh, to show that you are promotable and you have skills and so forth rather than as you said pam I, i'll be the one that essentially takes notes um so yeah i lo- love that uh, what about the notion for you um you know you talk about advocating for yourself because i think sometimes a lot of women come from this space where they go Oh, I don't want to do that. I it I I don't want to be seen as self promotional. Maybe I just you know keep my head down and keep doing good work. Um, like what would you say to a woman who says that to you? Don't. There's nothing wrong with if you have the backing. If you say I did this, I achieved that, uh, and really making showing concrete outcomes for everything you've achieved. Don't sit back and like you say, put your head down and ignore it. Uh, Really advocate for yourself. And I was uh, talking to someone yesterday. I said, don't be so Canadian. Be a bit more American and and brag about yourself and be proud of what you've done. I mean, there's so many things in my career that I am proud of. There's things that, you know, I've been overlooked for roles. I've been turned down for roles. I've made mistakes. Uh, I own up to, you know, if it was like, okay, that was, wasn't a great uh, decision to make and everything can be fixed and we fix it, but it, it, you need to advocate for yourself and never feel that, you know, as women were like, oh, I'll be seen as, you know, not, uh, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? Likeable or? Well, yeah, women want to be like and... and- they want they don't want to be confident because they might be seen as aggressive Mm -hmm. so be confident be who true to yourself only i'm the only one that can be pam allen the ceo of md management i i do pam allen really well um so do you really well and be proud of what you do because you don't want to look back on your career and say, oh, I wish I would have. I wish I would have. You want to look back on your career and say, I'm so glad I did that. I'm so glad I did that. Absolutely. And, and so what would you say if I asked you the question, and I know sometimes it's a hard one, like for you, what do you want your ultimate legacy to be? You know, you'll, you'll be in the role, as you said, CEO, uh, Pamela Allen, but what really is that maybe one or two things that you would want to leave behind um, in this role? I want, uh, I want people to be proud of being part of MD when I was CEO. And I want people to um, feel good about the work they're doing, the value they're bringing to clients. And I want them to say, uh, I believed in in Pam and her leadership style. Um, you know, work is important. Uh, the other side of your life is important as well, so you need to balance your life. But I just want people to be proud of working for a company that does amazing things for that profession, Canadian physicians, who take care of our families, who take care of us, you know, that's one thing that I'm very proud of is we take a stressor off of physicians' plates when they have so many other stresses on their plates. So um, I just want people to be proud of working for MD. Mm-hmm. Right. 
Um, and so I'm going to uh, maybe shift a little bit. And as okay. you know, the podcast really likes to to focus on aspects of sort of the future of or future mm-hmm. state. And I know you've been in the uh, investment industry a long time. I was wondering if you could maybe touch upon, you know, some of the trends or changes you've really seen them um, over the years that our that our list our listeners yeah, can can really get a handle of. Oh wow. Um, so I started in the early 90s and the investment industry was very different. It was very different. It was, there wasn't a lot of governance. The regulatory oversight is not what it is now. And, uh, you know, I talk, when I started doing investments, I took a course, a mutual fund course. I learned about all the mutual funds. And then I became licensed to sell mutual funds. I stood at a counter at a wicket like a teller. I had five mutual funds to sell, and I would sell mutual funds at a at a counter to to my wow. well. Now it's so different. There's access to information. Uh, investors are getting a really savvy and knowledgeable about what they deserve, and uh, being really aware of uh, what's out there, what they pay, the value that they get. Uh, it's much more transparent, which is good. It's a good thing in the investment industry, but there's also a lot more regulatory oversight. Um, just, you know, when I started, there was no World Wide Web. There may have been, but you didn't know about it, you know, and people having access to that information and getting bombarded with things that may not be totally accurate. So uh, investment advisors often have to kind of get through all of that debris, if you will, of all the information coming, what's real, what's not, uh, what's true, what's not, what's important and what's not. But yeah, like technology, um, the world, I find the world has become a lot smaller, especially with the internet, with all the social media out there. I mean, you get your news from TikTok or from X or Twitter or whatever it's called. That's so different than you know, I talked about having a paper out in the third grade. Papers were delivered at night. That's when you got your news, six o'clock news. Now it's just a constant bombardment and it's trying to weave your way through all of this information. So it's become more complicated uh, for the good. The investor protections are really important. So we really need to advocate for the investors. And it is, a you know, I remember advertisements for mutual fund returns. Like we'd have posters up in the brand, Mm -hmm. 10% on a balanced fund. You can't do that anymore. Uh, So it's it's a very different environment, a lot of scrutiny out there. And uh, it's hard to navigate at times. So you really need someone uh, to hold your hand through your journey, your financial journey of life. And Mm -hmm. uh, never take that for granted, having an investment advisor with you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you and you talk about like the advent of social media. There's so much information, really, for anybody to to look that up. Like, would you say um, uh, that's more of a challenge today to cut through to clients or to people that maybe want to be pros- prospective clients in terms of how do you manage like this flow of information? Because there, there, there's a real challenge just in general in terms of misinformation and even sometimes you know i see this too on social media platforms like do we need you know like financial advisors or investment advisors and and so forth and like how do you feel you can cut through all of that and, and still really you know provide really good advice to uh, to clients yeah there's a uh, it's funny having the information is good and it's not, <laughs> you know, sometimes you're, having you're, too much you're. information is not a good thing. But I do, I would, when I was an advisor and I was building my book of clients, uh, especially couples, I would always insist that uh, the husband and wife or whoever's important in their life uh, always came into the meetings. Uh, it wasn't just one person in the household that took care of it. Everybody needed to know. So I was really big on educating my clients. Um, but it is a relationship business at the end of the day. So having great relationships with an invest- with an advisor, a planner, whatever you need is very important. And you're going to get bombarded. Physicians, I find, are the most sought-after clients out there. And they get bombarded with things. 
Um, I'm proud to work for a firm that we know physicians best. We have d- data and insight onto physicians that other firms don't have. They might cling to, but they really don't. So yes, it's a lot, but making sure you have a good relationship with someone who you feel comfortable that has your best interests at heart and is looking at your whole picture. Financial planning isn't about uh, just investments. It's about Right. You know, your goals, everything. So make sure that uh, they're looking at you as a holistic person and uh, not just, you know, I have this much money. It has to be more than that nowadays. Yeah, exactly. Um, And what do you think then, you know, on that topic would be some of the more um, future trends, you know, when it comes to investing? Like, where do you think, you know, uh, some of these trends are are taking us and what can we maybe expect um, looking at this space? So one of the things that's really important right now is uh, ESG investing or environment, social and governance investing. So looking at companies that have uh, a really good ESG um, policy, if you will. So on the environment, so for example, uh, we had some physicians come to us and say, uh, we're very interested in being invested in fossil fuel free investments. So we created a fossil, it's a tongue twister, a fossil fuel free. Fossil fuel fund. free. There we go. And that was as a result of people wanting to divest of fossil fuels in their portfolios. You know, uh, the social aspect of ESG is one around, you know, being a good corporate citizen. You know, are the companies that you're investing in good corporate citizens? Are they, uh, you know, they don't have child labor, things like that. And then governance. Uh, Studies show that if a company has good governance, they provide better returns. So it's oversight on how their boards are made up. How do they determine executive compensation? What oversights do they have at their company Mm -hmm. to ensure they're doing things uh, the right way? So ESG, I find, is very important. Um, You know, there's there's a myriad of funds out there that can provide all these different investments. There's, I know there's a fund that has... The only investing companies where uh, most of the employees are women or they have women in leadership roles. So, but I really think the ESG angle is going to be really important in the future. Uh, for me, what's really important is uh, specifically the governance, mm. making sure that there's good oversight and the companies are, you know, the checks and balances are in place and uh, they're abiding by that. And then you'll see better returns that way over the long term. Investing is not a short term thing. Um, people think it is. That's, that, that's, a, that's a good message, too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, maybe a bit of a like a, a, a strange question. Like, um, do you think within um, this space that there's. You know, there's always these sort of disruptors. It could be, you know, the way that you do business. It could be a technological one. Um, do you do you think there is something on the horizon in the future that would kind of disrupt? Um, this, I'm this, always this expecting industry. something to come up from an unusual place that's like, wow, didn't expect them to get into that. Because we will, I find as consumers, we will consume things from many different places. So for example, I I said to someone a couple of years ago, Amazon's going to come up with, you know, some sort of investment platform or banking or something like Mm -hmm. that, because we trust Amazon as a company to deliver. I just ordered something last night that's on its way right now, which just boggles my mind. (laughs) But things like that, where you trust the company, they might diversify into other areas. So I'm always expecting the unexpected Hmm, and it's based on the trusting the company and not so much the product so make you know like i say we'll stick with amazon if i trust amazon as a company to provide uh efficient delivery of products and services why can't that translate into financial planning investment services all that kind of stuff so that's the disruptors that i see coming um, you know, it's not about, you know, we try not to look at tomorrow, but the day after tomorrow, what's going to be coming down the pike. And then how do you work with it? I remember when uh, 
you know, online trading, do it yourself came in in the 90s. And we thought, oh, that's it. the end of financial advisors altogether. Everybody's going to do it themselves. And then the market corrected and everybody couldn't do it themselves. And then robo advisors came out. Oh, that's the end of advisors. It's going to be robo advisors. And then we actually found a way to integrate those two platforms, self directed robo advisors with full fledged financial planning. So you may see something as a disruptor. But I think the companies will then integrate them into, okay, how do we use this disruption to benefit our company as well? So we're always looking, like I say, it's that day after tomorrow, future, futuristic style that kind of keeps us, you know, yes, that can come in. We'll disrupt, we'll be along the ride with the disruption as well. Yeah. And I guess that would also apply to this notion of AI, right? That's a very big hot topic, you know. Depending on who you speak to, you know, a, a scenarios are end of the world to right. life is going to be way more efficient. Yes. We'll have more time. Um, but how do you it? use it in your company? We use right. AI for right. mundane tasks that we don't want our humans doing that we could have AI doing. But uh, and we use it in other technologies as well. So if you use it for good, if you will, uh, it can re- really be beneficial, you know. Chat GBT and AI, they're talking about we won't have actors and actresses anymore because it'll just be all AI. That's a bit much. Um, but I think if we use it properly, um, and again, things like this don't take away from employment, they actually add to employment. They create more opportunities for the f- people coming up, the kids coming up. There's, you know, with AI, now there's more jobs and careers that probably weren't around a number of years ago. Yeah. That's the exciting part of it. It is. And very similar to, I remember when social media, you know, we started to see those social media platforms and it was like, oh, and then, uh, and now you have jobs that 10 years right. ago didn't exist, right? right? And related to, to those platforms. Mm-hmm. Now, what if, what if I said to you, um, and it's funny, my, my, my parents used to say this to me uh, growing up because they were, uh, you know, uh, minimum wage, right? Jobs. And I would always talk talk to them about like, oh, savings and investments. My mom's mantra to me was always, uh, only people that have money can invest, right? Um, How, how would you say like, that's actually not the case? You know, what would you say to a person like my mom, uh, who would ask a question like that? And why is uh, not only investing, but financial planning and all of that important for all Canadians? Well, financial planning isn't just about investments. That's one component, but it's about setting goals. What do what can you do to achieve those goals? Um, So I started investing twenty five dollars a month when I was in my twenties because I wanted to save up to buy a house. That was what I could afford at the time. But I I sat down and kind of mapped out what I was going to do to achieve that goal. So it's not just about, you know, I have all this money, what I do with it. It's I have a goal. How Help me achieve my goal. Um, What's the proper location? What do I do first? You know, insurance is a great example. You know, where, when do you get insurance? What type of insurance do you get? So I said, I wanted to save for a house. So when I was saving for a house, we didn't have first home savings accounts, uh, My son, when he started working, he said, do I start an RSP? I said, well, let's sit down and look at it. And we decided, no, it's best to start a TFSA. So it's things like that. That's financial planning is, you know, you have a goal. How do you achieve it? You have the power of time when you do it young. When when I had my children and they just came out with the RESP. So I got their social insurance number when they were born and I put $50 away a month into the RESP. And that I had time, the power of time kind of as I started investing more and I bump it up a little bit all the time and they got birthday money. I said, it's going into your RESP if you get birthday money. And then I I actually sat down with them and said, here's what I did and here's how much money the two of you have for your education. So it's, you know, and that was a goal. I wanted to ensure my children didn't have debt coming out of university. So I started saving when they were born. So financial planning is is not for the wealthy. A plan is not for the wealthy. It's for anyone who wants uh, to achieve a goal 
and they maybe don't know where to start or what to do. And having having an objective person help you with that yeah. because sometimes, you know, is $25 enough? Yes. And if they show you like this is over time and that every time there's a change in something in your life, you sit down with your advisor. How does this affect me achieving my goals and what to do? And I'm seeing working with physicians where they've come to us and said, you know, I, I did this on my own and, you know, and it's like, okay, you, let's clean up what you've done and make sure you have asset location is important. But you invest in your TFSA versus your RSP. Again, when do you start investing in RSPs? All that kind of stuff. So it's really important to ha- sit down with someone and say, I have a goal, help me achieve my goal. And some people have complex lives, you know, physicians when they incorporate. Some people just, you know, I just want to retire with my RSPs mm-hmm. and be there. Both need financial plans. Um, never look at it as it's something that's unattainable. It is attainable for everybody. Yeah. And I think to your point too, and like, you know, like the the response to my mom, I I always said was there's always an ebb and flow as well. Like to your point, like things will change, you know, um, especially today, a lot of Canadians, like economically things may be tight for people, but that's where you come in adjustments here. Maybe, maybe you can't save for a bit, but then you Mm. come back, but it's all about to your point, like, What's the goal? You know, how do we manage this? Um, and yeah, that was always for me uh, to my mom and dad. It was like there, where we can find ways to do it, yes. even though it may be very tight. You yes. Know, yeah. Sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I also wanted to, uh, there was another uh, sort of new initiative I was hoping you can uh, touch upon. I know it's sort of uh, under Scotiabank and MD Financial, and it's a, this creation of a new pension plan. Uh, for physicians as well. And it's called Medicus. Uh, and I was wondering if you could touch upon that, because I know you've actually had quite a, a hand in this. And I, I know similar to the future of investing, the notion of pensions, you know, how, what does that look like? How do we manage that moving forward? Like, what what is Medicus pension plan? And what, what do you hope to really achieve uh, through something like that? So it is, some, so physicians are self-employed. Uh, most of them are. There's some that are employed uh, in other jobs, but for the majority of physicians are self-employed. They don't have a pension plan. So I always share this fun fact. Uh, the RSP came out of physicians lobbying Ottawa to save for retirement because they, you know, it was at a time in the 60s when everybody tended to have pension plans. Physicians didn't. So they lobbied the government and the government created the RSP for physicians to save for retirement. Um, mm-hmm. so they don't have a pension. They've been asking for it for years. It's not easy to start a pension. As I've discovered, this is a true pension plan. It's not an IPP. It's not a target dated fund. It is an actual defined benefit pension plan for incorporated physicians, uh, th- in Canada. So we're very proud of it because it's something that physicians have been asking for for the longest time. We looked at it at MD a number of years ago. We didn't have the capability at that time to uh, build it because we wanted to build a real pension plan. Uh, fast forward to us working with Scotia Bank, and they have the resources, you know, the knowledge, uh, the the funding behind it because it's not cheap to start a pension plan. So we came together and created a Medicus pension plan. Uh, we're in almost every province. We have we're in seven provinces. And uh, so we're really proud of that fact. And it is something that uh, we created because we know our physicians, we know how they work, and we knew how to create the right, it's called a multi-employer pension plan. So basically the incorporated physician is the employer as well as the employee. And hearing people, I talked to a physician in BC and he talked about how his dad had a pension and, and died young. and thank goodness he had this pension because it allowed his mom to stay home with and raise the kids and then uh, not have that financial burden as well because she had this pension that she could rely on. So it's, it's one of those things where, um, 
you know, it's new. So we're taking our time to kind of build it up, mm-hmm. but we're really proud of showing that how much we value our clients and we know them and we hear them. Uh, yeah. So it launched last May mm. and uh, we're making great traction. We're getting great responses. And again, something I'm so proud that we could do uh, for our client base. And mm-hmm. especially at a time when you know, inflation, the economy, burnout, all that kind of stuff to give them that's another piece of stability that the Canadian physician community can have. Yeah. And I was actually going to um, ask about that. You know, as we know, um, I think it was uh, four years ago this month where we entered into Thanks. this lockdown. Um, you know, we had to deal with uh, a pandemic, COVID-19 mm-hmm. um, and physicians, you know, right. uh, that industry uh, or that profession, excuse me, really, really, yeah. you know, carried uh, the the brunt of it and for a few years and uh, I was hoping maybe you could you know touch upon you know what do you think from your perspective it's like being a physician right now and what are some of the trends you you foresee shaping that physician landscape in Canada as as you you know work so closely uh, Mm -hmm. here there's depth so we have a physician's council at MD so we have nine physicians um that come together on a quarterly basis and we talk to them about what they're seeing in uh, their day-to-day lives, uh, things that, uh, you know, we run our strategies by them to get feedback. And so I attend the meeting every quarter and you really hear about the burnout. Uh, You know, they can't keep up. The administrative burden is another one. Uh, you know, trying to take care. They really want to help their their uh, patients, but at times it's just, it's too much. You know, we know that um, it's there's a shortage of, fa- of family physicians specifically out there. And I think in the future, we're going to have to probably embrace some technology for physicians. They don't want to work like their predecessors, uh, you know, working 100-hour weeks around the clock. They want more work-life balance, which they deserve. And I know I talked to uh, the Provincial Territorial Medical Associations, the CEOs there, in their discussions with government. And that's a lot of provinces are pushing for supporting physicians to have a better work-life balance um, so that they're not getting burnt out. You know, there's other, you know, the administrative that I talked about, physicians have a lot of administrative burden on them. So we're working on something more to come on that to support that. And then just making sure that uh, the medical schools were getting as many graduates and getting them into uh, residency programs. So recently we just had all the residents uh, were doing their matching. So going into their chosen programs, but, and then as well, uh, bringing physicians in from other countries, recruitment that way. But I I think there needs to be a change uh, in how they practice because they are burning out, retiring earlier. Um, They're just, you know, they're not uh, spending time with their families like they'd like to. So there's a backlog. And we want to do everything we can to support the physician community in making sure that they feel supported. Mm -hmm. And because they are, when you talk to a physician about the things that they do, you just like, oh my goodness, I couldn't imagine going through a day like some of them go through it a day. So, um, you know, one of my advisors told me a story about, uh, she had a client come in to review his financial plan and she said he was looking a little frazzled and she asked, she's are you okay? And he's like, I was leaving the the hospital to come see you and an ambulance pulled up and they brought the patient out and he had, he was blue. He said, so I had to do a tracheotomy on him in the parking lot before I came here. And she just thought, oh, you know, okay, let's just take a moment. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so he just needed a moment to kind of collect himself. But those are the you know, they go through a lot and they take care of our, you know, life and death situations with our families. So we want to make sure we're taking care of them and that they're supported and um, that they can do the job that they want to do and feel fulfilled in that job, not feel like they're, you know, filling out documents more than they're seeing patients. 
Fair. And um, would you say that the majority of physicians, you know, um, sort of, or not understand investing, but, you know, uh, know also the importance of, you know, coming, coming to you as MD Financial to say, hey, uh, you know, I, I, I need help in terms of sort of advice and, and, and so forth. Um, yeah. Would you say there is, uh, I, I would hate to say it, but like financial literacy um, uh, amongst, amongst them? Yeah, they, uh, they talk to each other for sure. Um, but again, they understand the concept of, I don't know this. So like a general, a family physician will refer to a specialist. They don't know this area, so they bring in a specialist. And that's kind of how they approach, uh, most of them approach their investing and their financial planning is I go to someone who this is what they do. This is their specialty. And they, you know, we also do the same. We bring in specialists to talk about their insurance strategies, to talk about um, their wills and their taxes and all that. So they get that concept of, as well. There is, you know, the physicians who think, yeah, I can day trade and do whatever I like. And that's okay. We have a platform for that too. And they may decide at some point, I don't like day trading anymore. I need an expert to do this. But for the majority of physicians, they get that concept of, you know, you bring in the specialists, you refer to other colleagues. And, you know, when they don't know, they talk to someone who does know. And they have a team around them. They have pharmacists. Uh, naturopaths, you know, uh, chiropractors, all that kind of, they have a, the full fledged, uh, inter, you know, network that they can refer to, to take care of their, their patients. Mm -hmm. And so then on the, the notion of financial literacy and, and maybe just in general, like what would, what would you say to a Canadian in terms of how they can become more financially literate? So I always, uh, I'm an advocate for starting with your children or your family. I would sit down at the dinner table and talk about, I know this sounds great mom to have, you know, I talk about investments and I remember at one dinner. Uh, <laughs> they're, they, they're all at dinner and they're like, oh no, mom. no, mom's going to start it again. <laughs> I talked about their credit rating, how important that is. How do you buy a house? Like that was something my son said, like, how did we buy this house? So I explained to him the process you go through to buying a house. But it is important. Is it teach that at school, which, you know, is really disappointing that they don't learn a lot of that stuff in school along with algebra, physics, all that kind of stuff. But it is educating yourselves on what's important. Learning from, if you have a financial advisor, and you should, learning from your financial advisor. Why am I doing this? Or, or I've heard about this. Tell me about it. So it really is, and I, I say this to clients, like, you know, you trust your advisor and your advisor is going to do what's best, but you still need to understand why they're doing it and ask the questions. And if you see something, you know, why isn't it right for you? Um, I remember being at a conference where uh, someone got up and talked about how they invest and what they do. And then uh, someone, a lady sitting beside me say, said to me, should I do that? And I said, well, every person is unique. So I don't know if you should do that. She felt that she should do that type of investing. So it's really understand what, what works for you in your situation because every situation is different. There's so many factors that go into, you know, your health, uh, the health that's in your family. You know, life expectancy is huge right now. You know, people are living longer. You don't just retire at 65 and then you you know your life is 10 years after you retire you retire at 65 you could live another 30 35 years so how do you factor that in you could retire at 50 and then retire for a little bit and go back into the workforce so it's just that education and starting that early as early as you can uh, start that education share it with your your kids uh, your family. Uh, we don't, I find as Canadians, we don't talk about money and investments and all that very much, which is too bad. I think we need to be more transparent and open about that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's a very good point. I think that's a bit cultural too as yeah. well. Right? Yeah. 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 And I think I like it. And to your point is sort of ask, ask those questions, right? Have those conversations. Um, 
they, they really do have to start at in the house. And then I'm with you at, you know, at school too. I mean, yeah, yeah. even learning how to open, open a bank account, you know, how do you write a check? You know, all of that is, uh, do people still take checks? I don't know. Mm, I don't know. <laughs> May, possibly. <laughs> um, and so, uh, you know, in parallel with that or coupled with that, uh, we, we touched upon earlier the how much more complex, you know, the financial world is. So on, you know, on top of financial literacy, like what are other ways that you would tell Canadians to kind of stay informed and to be able to make very educated decisions about, you know, either their investments or their, their pension retirement plans? It is because everyone's situation is unique. It is important to have a professional that you talk to and you you trust. and And it's okay if you meet with someone. You're like, oh, not a great fit. Can I meet with someone else? Yes, absolutely. That's perfectly all right. Till you find that person that you feel good with. Um, ask questions. If you see something, like I said, if you you see something that. Uh, you're interested in, you know, I still don't understand Bitcoin all that much. I mean, that may sound for all the experience I have. I don't, I choose not to understand Bitcoin, but I just, I, there's something about it I just don't trust. But it's just, it is, there's a lot of information out there. So having someone that uh, you can talk through this with and ask those questions and become more informed is very important. And also, I will advocate for this, make sure that you're bringing in your loved ones into your financial discussions, <clears throat> whether it be your kids, your, your partner, do it together. Um, you know, I, I, my parents didn't talk a lot about their investments and all of that. And then when my dad passed, that's when I kind of had to get up to speed on what he was doing, what was going on. So it's really important to bring in those people that matter. Let the, my kids know where my will is. They know how I want to be buried, all that kind of stuff. So don't be afraid to talk to your circle of influence, your circle of trust about where things are, uh, what you have, where it is, how to access it. Again, I go through when my dad passed, I actually had to, my mom didn't even know everything we had. Mm -hmm. We had to wait for the mail to come to, with the statements to see what there was. So again, as can a cultural thing, Canadian thing, whatever, don't not talk about it. Talk to everybody about it and start investing early. The mm -hmm. power of time is huge. And also consider your longevity. Longevity, chronic diseases are on the rise. So you need to talk to your financial planner and your financial advisor about those things. Uh, if you have any chronic illnesses or anything that could affect your ability to, you know, retire in place. A lot of people want to stay where they are to retire and live out their their lives in their the home that they, you know, raise their family in. You know, is that important? What's important and what you need to take into consideration because you don't want to wait till it's too late and then you can't get the insurance or you don't have the means to uh, get the support that you need once you retire. So again, with people living longer and longer, sandwich generations, I'm in that right now. I've got my mom, I've got my kids. So I'm working between the two, trying to launch them all. Uh, when my dad passed, my mom really relied on me for uh, all those financial decisions and because she relied on my dad. So that's why get educated, know what you've got, know who your important people are in your life and let your advisor know who those people are. And let, let's let be open and have more of those discussions around money. Just yeah. And I, I think we tend to shy away from that. And um, like anything, the more transparency we have, um, here it is for us to yeah. understand the complexities of of the systems in which um, we operate. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So on on that note, Pam, thank you so much. Um, what we normally do is uh, I want to uh, close out for our listeners a couple of fun questions. Okay. So I've got, uh, and you have no idea what these questions nope. are. <laughs> uh, so question number one is: yeah. Is there a book you've recently read? uh that you would recommend 
to our listeners. And then the second one is, you know, if you are streaming service or, or mm-hmm. show, maybe movie person, is there something that you've watched recently that you said, oh, this is very interesting and willing to recommend it? Okay. Okay. So for books on uh, the business side, uh, good to great. Um, and we're talking actually at my leadership table about that and the flywheel, the hedgehog effect and all these things. So that's a great book. It's classic. It's timeless. It's been around for a long time. On the fiction side, I like biographies. Um, I've got a few. I don't, I've got Barack and Hillary behind me. Mm-hmm. Um but on the fiction side, I read The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo. I believe that's coming out into a movie. Mm-hmm. I loved that book. I read that one too. I think yeah. I'm making it into a movie. Yeah, yeah. I loved yeah. that yeah. book. That was fun. Mm-hmm. And uh, <laughs> a show I just started watching, uh, Pong Royale with Kristen Wiig. Oh, I find yeah. it's it's on Apple TV. It's a bit different than what she normally does. So, And it's set in the late 60s and it, it's very interesting to see those period pieces where uh, the roles women had and what they did but uh, that's what I found interesting but I just started watching that the other day and I'm like oh that's neat but uh, okay. and I'm always into real life mysteries you know like there's a Dateline podcast or something like that always into that. those are very popular yeah. <laughs> so both both on streaming platforms yeah. and podcasts. Yeah. Take a look at sort of the uh top podcast uh episodes. Like, mm-hmm. you're always in the mix. Yeah. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. So thank you very much again, uh, Pam. And this is an episode of the future of investing and pensions. <laughs>